question. And welcome to Good Morning Revolution, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good morning, good morning Revolution. Good. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Revolution. Rosanna and Anita and Michael and Karen. Karen, welcome. This is your first time on the show. Happy, happy to see you. Hope Hi. you're doing well. So it's been a big week. It's always a big week. I keep saying that. I got to come in with another introduction. This is lame. Um, the president. Well, I wish Scott was here because I like to tease him. I say, your president, your homeboy went to, uh, but he's not here. He went to Atlanta. Did anybody listen to his speech? He was speaking on voting rights. He went uh, down there to um, Spelman and uh, uh, there's a place where the historically black colleges have a joint area. Um, and he gave a big speech on voting rights. Did anybody listen to the speech? First of all, where were you when Mr. Biden spoke, went down to Atlanta and spoke about voting rights? Anita, you normally listen I, to these I, kinds of things. I usually do, but I, I just heard the, uh, the uh, highlights of it uh, this time. So oh, um, I thought it was pretty impassioned though. The, uh, I've heard the same clip taken out on, in numerous places. So um, yeah, he said, he, if you're either with me or Jefferson Davis, no, he didn't say me. He <laughs> said you're you're with Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis. Uh, he you're said, with Martin Luther King or Bull Connor. He you're said with, Strom, uh, Strom huh? Thurmond. He said Strom Thurmond uh, was more liberal on voting rights than you know current day Republicans like Rob Portman, for example, is just, uh, it's, it, I mean, everybody's focusing on cinema and mansion, but really what about these 50 Republicans who are refusing to, to support voting rights that they have supported really since 1965? Um, it's inexplicable okay. to me. But Ro 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 so he said you're either with Martin Luther King or, or George Wilder. You think that was too strong? Well, I think he's. I think he's making trying to make a point that you have to pick a side. But mm. I think for me, more telling is that the fact that the you know, uh, the people are pushing for all of this, and that, that's what's forcing him to be out there. And that to me is is more significant. There's a reason why he even took a stand on the filibuster, and this coming out, you know, to put some kind of restrictions or ends. I, I don't really fully understand it, but you know, I think once again, it's the people who are pushing this. And so we've got to continue to push in any way that we can uh, to, to make these things happen. Michael, do you think that, that they're with George Wallace? Well, Anita is saying that by, they're, they're worse than Strong Thurman. You agree? Yeah, I would say that. And but the thing is, is that I don't have any, you know, expectations in terms of the Republicans. I just assume, you know, they're not they're going to undermine the democracy at every turn. And so I don't want to make it about, you know, the centrist or center right uh, Democrats like Cinema and, and Manchin. But I think it's a shame that all of the work that Stacey Abrams and these, you know, kind of progressive voting rights activists, all that all that work they put into the the 2020 elections in, in terms of getting a democratic majority, a narrow democratic majority, but a majority nonetheless, um, with, with the two democratic senators from Georgia elected, you know, they put in all that work and then there's, it almost seems as if like the president and then some of the Democrats in the Senate are slow when it comes to voting rights. And so um, I, I kind of understand Stacey Abrams and, and these voting rights activists for not coming out and, and supporting Biden, because I think it's just too slow at this day and age, uh, you know, it's been how many years since the Voting Rights Act that was that was passed 1965, and we're still, you know, having these same issues. And so I think there's just no there's no uh, exception for it. Well, you know, Karen, there's been a big call starting all the way back in August. We went down to D.C. In, in August to the Voting Rights March. We had a contingent, and it was hot down there. It was always hot in D.C. in the summertime and humid. And a lot of the speakers were saying, yo, Mr. Brown, y'all need to step up to the plate. I know you're trying to get the infrastructure bills passed, and I know, but you got to speak out forcefully on voting rights. And uh, they feel like he hasn't, they haven't done it, or at least not as, that they were too focused on the, getting the infrastructure bills passed. Um, 
you 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 think that 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 they spent too much time focusing on the economy? Uh, I think that it's one and the same. I think that people fighting for their right to vote is people fighting for their lives. And I think that if the politicians don't understand that without folks feeling empowered, like they have a say in the government, uh, folks are not going to necessarily support them in upcoming elections, that they're not going to be able to get an infrastructure bill through. So I feel like there's sort of a bit of a uh, confusion or maybe folks are just trying to move in like the short term and losing track of what the long term looks like. But I mean, I think that they're totally within their rights to to raise as much hell as they want uh, or we raise as much hell as we want about the Voting Rights Act because without the vote, then people are just disenfranchised and then they're gonna become demoralized and demobilized too. So I think it's very important. Anita, we said there was a crisis of inaction because that march in DC only had about four or 5,000 people. Friend of mine, Jamal said it was 10,000, but I think he was being too generous. I think it was three or 4,000. Um, should have been 100,000, you know, because the New York Times the other day said that there was, a sl that the Capitol riot was taking place all across the country. Uh, slowly, deliberately, legislatively, and state legislature rewriting all of the rules. And, yes. Um, and people act like it, and it's been happening for a year. Is it happening in Ohio? Uh, well, of course, Ohio went for uh, went for Trump, um, and there isn't. We we already had Republican uh, legislators who have had their will already. They are gerrymandering like crazy, um, but the, actually their maps just got thrown out. So I think this voter suppression that's taking place in Ohio really is through that gerrymandering process. Um, but happily, the Supreme, Ohio Supreme Court kicked the maps back to the uh, redistricting commission yesterday uh, because they're, they said it was unconstitutional. So they only have eight more days to, to redraw the maps. I don't know what's gonna happen, but uh, we haven't had much change in the, in the actual voting laws or the role of the secretary of state as we have seen in other states um, happening. Suppression and uh, subversion of, of elections is what's happening. And it is yeah. hard. I mean, what, what Taryn said speaks to me, that demobilize, demoralize and demobilize. I think people just do feel um, disempowered um, when it comes to getting out there on the street. Um, How can you say that? There I just said millions it. Millions of people in the street after Breonna Taylor and, 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 and uh, George Floyd was, was, were murdered in the mm -hmm. biggest demonstrations in U.S. history. I right. mean, no, yeah, it we was, need that same. Huge. We need that same further. We need that same feeling and and fire for for voting rights. And that's why I kind of wonder. I don't think like leadership is lacking because I think like there are figures like Stacey Abrams and others, you know, out there in the movement that can like lead this thing. But I ask myself, you know, how serious are like the Democratic part, like the Democratic establishment, about winning the twenty twenty two elections? Because you know, there's political analysts saying you know it's going to go the other way. And because like a whole lot hasn't been done, a whole lot of these promises that Biden, you know, originally, you know, promised during his campaign um, haven't been lived up to. And so I asked myself, if, if those analysts are saying that, why are they not passing these voting rights to ensure like a victory and that they don't lose the Congress? You know, it's it's it's, wait, con wait, wait, it's wait, wait, contradictory. Wait, wait. Yeah. Let's, let's look at the whole picture. We got the largest strike wave since, since uh, 2018 and two more sets of workers uh, in two parts of the country went on strike in this week. In, in, uh, in Colorado, 8,000 worker, uh, workers at Kroger's on strike. And then, uh, Terry, what was that thing you sent me last night about the railroad workers in Ohio, largest union of railroad workers. You shut down the railroad, they're in trouble. <laughs> I've been working on the railroad. And, and so workers are moving, they're striking, they're mil and they're winning. Rosanna, 24, I counted the, the AFL-CIO put out a list of the organizing drivers that 
24 have won in the last couple of months. So that's a big thing. So that indicates that, you know, people are ready to struggle if they're given leadership. Am I right or wrong? I agree. I think, I think uh, you know, it's, it's the workers are exerting their power and understanding their power, but there's also this need, this impo it's important to understand the process of struggle. And it's, it's, it, it's step-by-step -step kinds of things that have to happen and not to give up because in the end, you know, workers do have the power. It's just uh, being steadfast and continue even during those, uh, you know, those low points or the, you know, those points that may seem uh, demoralizing, but it's, it's not giving up that that's key. I was telling a friend of mine, there's a crisis of it action. He said, well, Joe, wait a minute now. I'm not sure you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Karen, he said, because in Georgia, they're fighting in Georgia. And Michael made that point just a, and he said, and same thing is true in, in, in Florida, where they're trying, you are in Florida right now, and uh, uh, Anita, there's a big fight in, 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 in Florida and in South Carolina. So it kind of depends on where you are and the degree of maturity and mobilization of, of the Democratic with a small d uh, forces. Um, would you agree with that, Tara? Was that? <laughs> yes, I would agree with that. Okay. Well, um, so and then we got what has the Communist Party done? People are going to say, well, you want to criticize all those other people. What have you done lately? What have you remember that song? What have you done for me lately? <laughs> so we got to get out there too. And by the way, Monday is Martin Luther King Jr.'s official holiday. And there are going to be events all over the country celebrating. And the King family said, don't come out if you're not willing to come out and struggle for voting rights. Don't celebrate this holiday unless you, and in DC, I'm thinking about going on Monday, there's going to be a march across, what is that bridge? The Frederick Douglass Bridge? It's the bridge that goes from Northeast into Anacostia, not down by the stadium. And um, for voting rights, and it's going to uh, march through the heart of, of, of the black community in, uh, Southeast Washington, uh, which is good. so really important to get on the ground and, and, and be involved in those kinds of uh, struggles because working people are hurting. Inflation has gone up 7%. Taryn, why? Is it, be, is it the supply chains or is it the uh, corporate Greed? Is it workers are making too much money? What is it? Well, um, I think it's important, first of all, to kind of break down what that 7% number is. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases its uh, CPI, sorry, it's the Consumer Price Index summary for each month. And they recently, a couple of days ago, released their report, uh, which basically covered all of 2021. And while all items experienced an inflation rate of 7%, I think it's important to point out that commodities like gasoline actually experienced an inflation rate of 50%, 49.6%. Um, you know, so it's not necessarily even that 7%. Basically, the way that inflation is calculated is that they figure out the prices of a whole lot of things, and then they, they put it into a basket and they kind of average it all out, right? But when you actually go into the basket and you figure out what's in there, you can see that there's a lot of unevenness. Now, what I think is remarkable about the freight rail, sorry, the rail freight strike is that most of what's moved in the United States via rail uh, is generally stuff like commodities, like energy. Um, and so I wonder what that impact is going to be. The reason why inflation is going up is there's a there's a whole lot of different things around that, but it really does break down to like who it is that has the power in our class society, and it's not us. So even the bourgeois economists 
a couple of days ago actually released a letter. Uh, and these are people who got like Nobel prizes in economics. And so they're very extremely bourgeois, uh, but they were basically blaming major corporations for raising prices on items to do more than cover their own costs, right? So there's this sort of attempt at every single stage to, to, to get as much as they possibly can out of every single worker in this economy. Um, and the fact that folks didn't necessarily get evicted last year or the year before that, um, and the fact that folks maybe didn't have to pay off their mortgages, um, these corporations, I know it's not like they're necessarily directly involved in this you know, landlord scheme or, or that they're selling houses, but they, they need to seek to recover their profits elsewhere, right? And so that's going to result in a rise in prices. Now, what really concerns me is that the Fed was talking about raising interest rates again. I'm sorry if this is getting too technical for the show, but basically if the Fed decides that they wanna raise interest rates again, like they did back in the 1970s when I wasn't born yet, but y'all probably experienced that inflation. Um, the result of that was not only just like this really extreme austerity uh, on workers in the United States and the, you know, it was a huge blow to labor, but it also resulted in third world debt going through the roof, skyrocketing through the roof, right? So all of a sudden, all of these countries that had taken IMF and World Bank loans now owed massive amounts of money uh, to the US and they had to refinance everything. And that's when you ended up with all these neoliberal quote unquote reforms being shoved onto countries in Latin America and Africa and Asia. So that's, when, that's, that's the when global- That's said the third world debt is unpayable and uncollectible. <laughs> right, well, yeah, I mean, in some ways, but it does have an impact um, if those rates do go up, just given the current sort of like global balance of forces. In the United States, though, if interest rates go up, people are going to feel that. People are going to feel that shock. And the thing is, is that wages have not kept up with inflation. So usually one would assume that inflation rises with wages. Uh, wages have not risen in tandem with with you know, inflation at this point. And so if they are going to raise the interest rate instead of going to these corporations and saying, hey, guess what? You can't just add an extra 40% on this used car, um, then yeah, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt a lot with consumers. I don't know if you heard that, but Taryn just called you old. She said, I don't know if y'all <laughs> who were born, I was born 1973. I don't know if y'all, y'all old heads, right? But she, she said that you're old, you're old head too. But my question, and Michael, is, is price control, is that the solution? Should there be a free, a price freeze? <laughs> I, don't, I think that'd be like putting a Band-Aid on cancer. Um, I, I, I remember, uh, for example, in Mexico, um, there are certain things like that are controlled. So like um, rice, beans, tortilla, and bread, those, are, those have always been like, they've always had price control on it. And supposedly it, it's helped the, the lower classes. Um, and then now with the kind of like left leaning, leaning government in Mexico, they've been giving, you know, what the right wing would refer to as like handouts, you know, enabling like the, the, the working class and um, the poor to be able to like study, go to school, have the essentials to live and so forth. But it really hasn't um, put a dent in, in like the overall problem. You know, you can't really uh, reform yourself out, 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 of, out of capitalism, as uh, W.E.B. Du Bois said. So I think we really have to look at longer term solutions. I think you said it before when we were talking about the socialist moment. W what we need is more socialism. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we have to keep our eyes on the prize, uh, but fight for these necessary reforms on the way, because people are suffering right now. They're going to be suffering later, too, but they're suffering right now. And so that's why I think going back to our first point on voting rights, had, had the, the Democratic Party, when they won the election in, in 2020 and won the majority in Congress, had they known how turbulent it was going to be to be, you know, pass the infrastructure bill and all these things, they should have been thinking forward and saying, you know, we're not going to be able to achieve all of this in two, four years. And so we have to, you know, make sure that we maintain this majority and able to get all of this passed. And, and you know, so it's just, it's, it's all connected as, as, uh, Taryn said at the beginning, I think you can't think about voting rights and economics uh, as separate entities. It's all as one because, you know, people want to feel represented and they're suffering right now. The pandemic continues, unemployment continues and so forth. But what about Anita? They should, they say they should open up the uh, petroleum reserve and allow more oh, uh, uh, 
crude oil to be refined and turned into gasoline and diesel and other products. Is that a solution? What about fracking? More fracking. I, <laughs> that... I am certainly not an expert in in, uh, in the energy, uh, uh, the impact of energy on, on the economy, but I think uh, Michael's right. We really need long-term solutions uh, to these problems, and maybe that's a short-term something that will help um, get us through. But I think uh, what we need is that you know um, redistributing uh, wealth, basically, where where people people's needs are taken care of, their basic needs, um, and uh, just not let people you know have about millions of dollars. Um, extra that they don't really um that they're they're they shouldn't use there's they're you know that they've stolen from every worker in in the united states so Rosanna, when we were younger and we were younger at one point in history i remember that 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 and i'm still young at heart so are you uh i remember that nixon froze wages was it nixon yeah nixon froze wait was, or was it reagan i forget which Froze, somebody help me. Froze wages and prices. It was a wage and price freeze. And I was like, okay, freeze the prices, raise my wages. What's wrong with that? Anybody want to take it? I mean, you agree, Rosanna? I mean, why not? Well, that's, yeah, I think, you know, in part, like here in California, uh, $15 an hour is the minimum wage. And I think that because we're this fight to raise a minimum wage could also be a factor as to why these companies are, are raising their prices on everything. They think that people may have more money or something like that. I don't know. But uh, I mean, we have to demand that, that you know, we have a livable wage. And really $15 is not a livable wage, especially in California um, with, with everything so high. But I think we do need to demand a a, a cap on on prices on goods and also a, a a livable wage, not a not just a minimum wage, but a livable wage. And the wage in Ohio is half that. We, 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 huh? The wage in Ohio is half of fifteen, basically. It's less than seven. Yeah, seven and a half dollars an hour. Seven well, something, right? Yeah, but you can get a ten-bedroom apartment in in, in, uh, in Youngstown not, for well, five hundred dollars a month. Maybe in Youngstown. <laughs> not in Columbus. Uh, Karen, what's the solution? I mean, I think that, you know, to Michael's point, the only way that you can really fix inflation, the only way that you can really fix uh, economic policy that's going to be bad for our class is to organize. And so I think that if the best way to fight inflation would be to pass the Voting Rights Act and also pass the PRO Act, because I think, again, these are all reflective of a balance of forces between classes. Um, no one would be recommending one policy over another unless there was some sort of you know, class pressure to do so. So to Michael's point about Mexico and there being price controls on certain types of goods, in the United States, we also have that. It's called the farm subsidies, right? And so here in the United States, you can get beef and dairy and meat for much cheaper than you could elsewhere because the government already gives out money to producers in order to offset the price of what they bring to market. So the reason why they do that is not because you know, the working class has demanded more hamburgers or cheeseburgers or whatever, but rather because the farmers have like a very strong kind of leverage over, over that sort of thing, so over that kind of policy. So I think that the way that we can get worker forward policy, worker forward economic policy made is to organize workers and to organize ourselves and pass the Voting Rights Act and pass the PRO Act. Well, it sounds to me like if there's no immediate solution to the problem, we're in trouble in November because the gas is still doubled and the cost of rent has gone up and cars 30% higher than 40 than they were last year. I mean, people, you know, and, and, and here's the thing, you know, um, <clears throat> We keep talking about fighting fascism, fighting fascism, fighting fascism, all of which I agree with. And, and, and that will motivate a certain section of the population. But you got to combine that with bread and butter issues. You just can't run against Trump. 
Am I wrong about that? Because if you don't, you know, OSHA and 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 the Center for Disease Control just decided that we were going to one OSHA let the uh, uh, the standards for healthcare and uh, safety expire. They passed them in June. Everybody had to comply with them. They expired in January. And then the Center for Disease Control reduced the number of days from 14 to seven for isolation, no, five, for isolation for COVID. Why? Because companies didn't want, <laughs> they were short their workers and they didn't want to pay overtime and this kind of thing. And so people get angry about that. And they're going to blame it on, guess who? Biden, Harris, Pelosi, the Democratic Party, and and I mean, so we gotta, yeah, you're right, Ted. We gotta organize and we gotta push. So the AFL-CIO and the nurses union filed an injunction in federal court demanding that y'all gotta back up that the labor department enforce permanent health and safety guidelines for working class people. And our party has to support that kind of thing, no? Anybody? I agree. Anita? I think, uh, I, Rosanna? Yeah, I think, you know, we do need to support all the bread and butter issues. We have to still keep our eye on this fascist trend that's, that's you know, uh, trying to pass uh, laws and things like that. But it's, you know, the, the way we look at the at society in the world is it has to be full a full complete look not just one sided or one aspect of it we have to also <clears throat> um, build those links how are these things linked together and 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 focus on the issues and and stay away from all of this whether it's the democratic party the republican party or anything like that it's the issues that we have to fight and rally and organize under and that's really key because if we focus on an individual or or a party then we lose sight of what's really important and you know passing passing the pro act and defending voting rights those are really key and if we are anti this or anti that and and lose sight of what's really key, then we're losing the fight. So we have to stay focused on, on the fight. And, and whoever joins us on that fight, that's who we fight with. Michael, how they do it in Chile? The, 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 the Communist Party and the other revolutionary and progressive forces in alliance with uh, some of the liberal and sense, they want a big election. Yeah, in, in, in December, it was kind of a, not a big surprise, but uh, they were able to build a coalition uh, that was really communist led called Aprevo Dignidad. You know, I, we, I approve uh, with dignity. And um, they were able to have the coalition led by the candidate Gabriel Boric, who he will be the second youngest uh, world leader when he takes office in, in uh, March. Um, he at 36 years old, he's 35 right now, but I think he has a birthday in February. And I mean, you're talking about a broad coalition of forces to defeat uh, fascism. It was led, you know, in part by the Communist Party, but you know, the center, you know, the liberals, Christian Democrats said, you know, we don't want to go down in history as backing a second fascist takeover. You know, they already had Pinochet, you know, there for a couple uh, decades after they toppled um, Allende's government in 1973, and so you see that, and you know that that. Uh, balance of forces. I love calling it a, a left center alliance because it really is the left that's leading it, you know, in, in, uh, in the words of Gus Hall. And then you see something similar also in Honduras. Um, but what were the, the issues that they ran on? Do, do you have a sense of that? Was it lower With the rent? Issues. Was it higher wages? Was it on the environment? What, what was well, they ran, yeah, on environment. In fact, um, the mayor of uh, Santiago, her name is Irasi uh, Hessler. She's a 31-year-old member of the Communist Party, you know, mayor. Oh, my God, 31 and 36, the mayor. 31 years old, yeah. And she's in the top five most well-known women in the world in terms of, like, um, fighting against climate change, you know, uh, uh, trying to save the planet. She's up there with Greta Thunberg and um, uh, Ilhan Omar's daughter. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty big deal. 
um, on that front. And they're also really um, the, the party of uh, uh, feminism. They embrace that title of fighting for women's rights in Chile. You know, they have uh, Camila Dowling, who was a great student leader, um, alongside Gabriel Boric, who won the, uh, the, the presidency. You know, they were friends and, and call, in fact, they were rivals at one time. Uh, competing for control of the student senate and the leadership on campus and now they're you know great allies in the movement for for democracy and socialism and so we'll see how things pan out because things are also looking good and uh honduras also with an alliance that took power against the fascist danger um with a a, a woman president with her her last name's castro and so that's also exciting and it just reflects congratulations kind of, you know, in honduras and uh, and uh, chile Michael, you had the last word. We got a program on Sunday. Michael Honey is going to be talking about Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, uh, you can you can find it where, Michael? At, at cpusa.org? Yeah, it's at Facebook 7 p.m. Page. on Sunday. And uh, the event is called Martin Luther King's Fight for Labor and Justice. And you can uh, register to get the recording or to attend live at 7 p.m. on Sunday. Sharon, thank you for coming. We're very happy you were able to join with us. I'm going to invite you back. I want to hear more about some of these solutions to inflation. I just cannot accept that I just got to have to keep paying more and more and more and more money. And there's nothing I can do about it except organize. I mean, I mean I'm in favor of organizing, but I want some short-term relief. So it's either going to be a price freeze or a raise, wage hike or something. Capitalism so, uh, sucks. Have a good weekend, Anita, <laughs> as always. Stay strong, Thanks, stay Joe. safe, stay in the fight. We'll see everybody next week. Take care. Bye. Bye.